I've been really blessed to travel around to a lot of different congregations, which means I've also been really blessed to experience a lot of different types of worship. A lot of these worships and a lot of these congregations start out in a real similar way, which is they have a time of sharing prayer requests or joys or concerns. And a lot of these prayer requests seem to focus around different types of health concerns. So you'll sit in worship and you'll hear somebody say, my grandma's in the hospital, or my best friend broke his leg, or my boss is feeling sick, or I have a friend who... And, they, and the cycle continues and people keep sharing about all the different health issues that are facing their families, their loved ones, those who are close to them. And, and as you look around the congregation, you'll see a lot of people writing these down on their bulletin or, or putting them into a prayer journal that they keep with themselves. But I begin to wonder, how often do we go beyond the back of the bulletin where we write these names? Or how often do we go beyond just simply sharing a prayer on the behalf of those that we've heard shared in that morning? How often do we really invest ourselves in authentic relationships with those that are suffering around us? How often do we really get involved in their lives in radical ways? From Mark 12, 28 through 34, one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and besides him there is no other and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Unlike previous encounters with the scribes and Pharisees in the Gospel of Mark, the scribe does not pose a hostile question for Jesus. He knew that Jesus was aware of the hundreds of precepts of the law. So the question was not if he would know them, but which would he choose? At the center of this text is the question, what is most important? As Zach and I began pastoring full time for our congregation in Orange, California, we found ourselves constantly wrestling with this question. As I read this text, I could identify with the scribe, asking Jesus to help us live what matters most. So we began this new journey as full-time pastors. And as we began, we decided that probably one of the most important things for us to do would be to reach out to all the congregation members. So we decided that we were going to give them all a call and see when a good time would be for us to meet for dinner or coffee or just to sit down and have a chat. So it came time to call Rosa and Robert. I picked up the phone, I called Rosa, and, I, and she said hello, and I said, Hi, my name's Zach, I'm here with Katie, we're new here, um, and we just want, we're wanting to get to know folks in the congregation. Rosa responded by saying, Why are you here? What are you doing? We don't need you. And to hear that, those words, only two weeks into a new job and a new place we had never been, I was quite shocked, I didn't know what to do. So I found myself on the phone kind of saying, wanting to say anyway, I'm not sure what we're doing here, and I'm not sure how we can be helpful. But instead, I tried to articulate that we wanted to live out the mission of Christ in orange in new and in authentic ways. And Rosa continued to say, well, we don't need you to do outreach. We don't need your help. Why are you here? The phone call kind of left with that tone, and I felt really un unsettled about it and really kind of shocked by it. So Sunday came, and Rosa came up to me at church, and I didn't know where, we, where the conversation was going to go. I didn't know what she would say. She grabbed my hand, and she said she was sorry. She said she had had a really tough week, that earlier that week she had had chemo treatments, that she was feeling isolated and alone, and she just kind of took that out on me, that I called at the wrong time. She began to share her story with me about her fight with cancer and how it had been in her life. After getting to know her better, we finally decided on an opportunity where we could get to know her and her husband more closely, and we decided that we would get together at their home for dinner. 
Sometimes the gift you have to offer as someone new in a congregation is the opportunity to just listen in a different way. We can all be guilty in congregational life of letting the ordinary rituals and rhythms dull our attentiveness to one another. Sometimes things are said or not said, and hurts are felt and never spoken. Communication can be stifled and misunderstandings linger. We discovered quickly that through no malicious intention of this congregation, this family was feeling somewhat abandoned. Rosa had been struggling with cancer and expressed with us her sense of congregational neglect. We listened intently to those feelings that so many of us can relate to, feeling a disconnect between spoken belief and actual practice. We also learned as this story began to unfold that the family had really expressed need in a way that people could respond to. Often news was shared after the fact, and understandably, there was a certain amount of privacy with Rose's illness that clouded possible communication. A relationship was strained, and it was all in the details, which are, we have learned, the substance of our relationships with one another. The details are the way we live our faith. How often in congregational life do we miss the seemingly small things, like making a phone call or sending a card or stopping by a home or doing something with that spirit prompting to be present with another? As the sense of frustration eased, we also heard another story of a husband and wife, Robert and Rosa, who had opened their own home for over a decade to children in their neighborhood responding to a sense of call to create a safe space and teach about Christ. In the opening territory of relational sharing, we found a common passion for mission and points of alignment with their giftedness in the congregation's own journey of discernment. So we continued to cultivate that relationship over the next several months, and we discovered more and more about Rosa's passion for the mission of Jesus Christ and her passion for youth to engage them in this mission in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we continued to, to grow in our relationship together, we decided as a congregation that we were going to have a peace camp. This was going to be a camp for all the neighborhood kids to come and to learn about the peace of Jesus Christ. It was going to be an opportunity of growth, an opportunity to journey into our discipleship as a community of Christ. Rosa put in hours and hours. She worked with Katie and myself, going around the neighborhood, passing out flyers, getting resources ready to teach the kids about peace. And the first night came, and we had one kid. One kid. Everyone always asks, is it worth it for one? But when, let me tell you, when one kid shows up, that question becomes really real. Katie and I and Rosa felt a little defeated but we decided that it was worth it for one kid. And so while we had 20 volunteers and one kid, we decided to continue with the program. And we went through the, we went through the night with everyone participating together, singing songs together, doing the craft together, eating the snacks together, playing the games together. Well, as the week progressed, our camp began to grow slowly but surely. The second night, we had two kids. The third night, we had four kids. The fourth night, we had six kids. And on the last night of peace camp on that Friday night, we had an open community dinner to share with the parents and our neighbors about the peace of Christ that we had shared all week long together. And we had over 50 people come to this dinner. It was, it was such a pivotal moment in our relationship with Rosa, a moment that really proclaimed to the world that we were living into our discipleship in a new and exciting way. A few months later after peace camp, our phone rang early in the morning, and we discovered that Rosa's cancer had spread to her brain, that the cancer had become really aggressive, and that they were going to have to do new treatments for her to try to fight the cancer. Immediately, we got in the car, we drove to the hospital, we prayed and administered to Rosa, we talked with the family, we wanted to see what we could do, and we began a new stage of our relationship, a new stage of vulnerability in this relationship to what God was up to in the midst of us. For the next several weeks, we found ourselves at the bedside, anointing with oil, hands on head, prayerful and hopeful. 
because the lines of communication had been fully opened, because relationship had been restored, because we had experienced mission side by side and were transformed through ministry with one another, something was different. The congregation began to fully embody the radical hospitality that was sought in the beginning, not out of a sense of obligation, but of deep love, responding to the spirit prompting them to respond. Several times a week, families were coming to the home, some from many miles away to bring warm meals and ministry of presence. I was humbled and moved by this generous outpouring of love and support. Then in the midst of an incredible, difficult situation, we were at the hospital with Rosa. She was progressively getting worse. And the doctors came in and wanted to talk to the family about moving Rosa to hospice. As Katie and I stood there uncertain of what words to share or what we could do, we said that we would just step into the hall and allow the family to make the decision and that we would be right there if they needed any, anything from us. Randy, her son, grabbed our hand. He pulled us in close and he said, don't leave, you're part of our family. He pulled Katie in close and he kissed her on the cheek and he grabbed my hand to let us know that we were part of the family. It was a powerful moment because this was a relationship that had not started off the best and it was a relationship that we learned that they had felt neglected in that they had felt hurt at times in. But in the midst of this incredible moment, they wanted us there because they felt loved, because we were part of the family. We were in mutual relationship with one another. And then a few weeks later, as Rosa was on hospice and she was in her living room at her home, we got a bunch of people from the congregation, about 25 or 30 of us, and we drove down to her house we surrounded her bed where she laid, and we began to sing songs from the hymnal. We began to sing and to pray. We held hands. We cried. We remembered joyful times with Rosa, times she made us smile and laugh. And in that moment, the kingdom of God came near. It was powerful. A few hours later, after we had left, Rosa passed away. Like the scribe, we were searching for deeper meaning and understanding. We wanted to know what is most important, what matters most. This text from the Gospel of Mark reminds us that sometimes as we wade through the rituals of our faith, we can miss the heart of it, which is justice and reconciliation. Even as Jesus proclaimed that the scribe was not far from the kingdom of God, they were caught up in its reality. Together, they were glimpsing the world as it could be, dwelling together in that deeper space where love of God and neighbor broke down the dividing walls of hostility and tension between them. Through living into this question, we continue to discover new possibilities of answers as we pay attention to God's Spirit in the midst of our relationships, moving us toward wholeness and peace. With Rosa, we found in her vulnerability with us and our congregation, a door to the kingdom of God. In her passion for ministry, we were challenged to reach out toward our neighbors and discover God inviting us deeper into our community. We were invited as a community to awaken and live this kingdom of God vision with one another for the sake of the world. Even in her death, she was bringing us together standing at the threshold of all we were called to be. Loving one another, not in abstract ways, but in the particularities of relationship, is where God's vision for us begins to emerge. God's vision is rooted in the realities of what is. We cannot experience the kingdom of God and remain separated from one another and God. Where is God present and inviting response in your ordinary relationships? What glimpses of the kingdom do you notice when you begin to really love others? Possibilities for kingdom awareness are resident everywhere. Will you choose to see? This is why this is so powerful. It awakened a community to something real in our midst. 
It awakened us to the vulnerabilities of the Holy Spirit that were surrounding us. The question is, why are we here? Why do we choose to come here Sunday after Sunday? What matters most for this journey ahead? As a congregation, we had become complacent with certain things. But as we began to grow in the mission of Jesus Christ through a peace camp and through different relationships, we began to see the kingdom of God come near. To be a disciple of Jesus, we're called to go so much deeper, to become so much more than just Sunday morning Christians. But we're called to invest authentically and vulnerably in the relationships with one another that we have day in and day out. To become disciples of Christ, authentic communities of Christ, in every capacity of our lives. What is God up to in our midst? How can we be a part of it? And how can we bring the kingdom of God a little bit closer to this place? This was a relationship that started off rocky, that was uncertain, that we didn't know how it would go. And it transformed us. It didn't transform us because we were so great or did something so profound. It transformed us because we were vulnerable to each other. We were vulnerable to the Holy Spirit that dwells within each and every one of us. Within you and with me, it moves, it surrounds us all. We were transformed because we recognize that our welfare resides in your welfare. That to be an authentic community of Christ, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, means to live in to the Holy Spirit that surrounds us in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in people we haven't even met, in strangers. But when we recognize it, when we're vulnerable to it, and when we respond to it from the promptings of God, we become an authentic community of Christ. But what is so profound and powerful is that the kingdom of God comes near. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. May we be awakened this day to the reality of the kingdom come near that is resident in the details of life surrounding everywhere we are. May we find ourselves constantly asking, What is most important? What matters most? And may we be assured, as we continue to extend our reach and love toward God and neighbor, that we too are not far from the kingdom of God.